everybody, and welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and my guest this week is a professional Foley artist and a YouTuber, Stefan Fraticelli. We're going to talk with him about what it's like to play for a living, and he is also uh, available at Audio Studio, and that's spelled odd, like O-D-D. I O audio studio on, uh, on YouTube or the website as well. So check them out there. You can find playful humans at playfulhumans.com. Take a playfulness quiz or join our community of other adults rediscovering the power of play. It's at playfulhumans.com. Here we go. Wait for the woohoos. There you go. Stefan, welcome to the podcast. We like to start out with the joke of the week. The joke of the week is brought to you by pizza rolls, because why not? Everybody likes a pizza roll. <laughs> so my joke of the week is, what do sea monsters eat for lunch? Not pizza rolls. What do sea monsters eat for lunch? I do not know. Please tell me, Mike. Fish and ships. Uh, <laughs> are they all always right, you, are they always that much of a groaner? Uh, no, but they they vary in quality. But they are all dad jokes. Do you have any good uh, good bad or good dad jokes? I can I can probably match that. I don't know if I can top it. Um, <laughs> I have I have a nine year old, so I have a lot of experience with dad jokes. Um, so okay, a guy walks into a doctor's office and he's got a hot dog up his nose and he's got a carrot stick in one ear and he's got a celery stick in the other ear and he says doc what's wrong with me the doctor says you're not eating properly <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so you had to add your own sound effects because you're a foley artist so i don't know how many people actually know what that term is but we should probably start there you are the person who adds all the sound effects to movies tv shows animated uh shorts and and things like that right uh, how else would you describe a foley artist yeah i mean i'm i'm one of the people that does that there are you know the sounds that get added into films tv shows etc they're kind of broken down into a couple of categories some are done by foley artists some are done by sound effects editors so sound effects editors uh, actually have a much broader job. They're doing all the stuff like um, explosions and uh, you know nature sounds like wind and rain pouring. Um, they would also do anything like electrical, like lights buzzing in a room, any kind of ambient sounds. Hmm. Um, whereas Foley artists do sounds that are related to the actor's movements in the scenes um, or animals' movements in the scenes. So for instance, um, all of the footsteps uh, for all of the characters in the film, if you hear heels walking down a marble floor, that was done by me or someone with the same job as me. Um, we also would handle, like if someone picks up a newspaper, folds it up and puts it into a knapsack, um, all of that gets recreated afterwards. Uh, so I would actually get a newspaper and a knapsack and watch the scene in question. And we record that sound in a controlled studio environment like I'm in here. And um, that becomes like a layer of the final soundtrack that you hear in the film. So the reason for that is on set, um, the recordists who are excellent at what they do are very focused on getting the dialogue clean and all the other stuff like putting down a coffee mug or writing or you know anything really is sort of secondary so we go through and heighten it afterwards um, but it's always related to movement on the screen and it's things that we're capable of covering in a studio environment like we can't do uh explosions you know so those get put in from like libraries or from uh recordings on location etc yeah, I think that's really interesting. I like what you said about a layer of it because you do have the dialogue layer. I've also seen you mention on your YouTube channel, there are there's the music, the composition mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. layer, which is also added by somebody completely different. You have these other sound effects, but it, to me, I, I have never figured out, and I, I'm a radio, I'm an audio guy and obviously a, a podcaster and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
never quite understood how they got all of those so clean. I, I saw an old untouched version of the original recording of a Star Trek scene that yeah. was deleted. And there was a ton of background sound and other like uh, fan noise or, or other things from them bumping into things in the spaceship and stuff. And it, the audio sounded terrible. I'm like, how did that ever become a movie? They yeah. have to take a lot out, right? And then you have to add it back in. Uh, For sure. Yeah, I mean, like when, when they're shooting on set, I mean, first of all, sometimes absolutely sets can be really noisy. You could be shooting at an airport. It can be windy. They can have fan machines. They can have all that. In those cases, the actors actually go back to a studio in post-production and re-record their lines uh, in time with themselves oh. on the screen. So they, they redo their lines with the same emotion and they end up using that. And when they do that, then there's nothing at all left uh, audio wise from the original takes. So Foley becomes super important because then you're not even layering, you're just, you're it, right? So everything has to be there. And then of course, you know, the spaceship rumbling sound and all that kind of stuff that the sound effects editors would put in. So it's a big, it's a big team effort. And uh, hopefully by the end, when you watch the film and listen to it, you feel like what you're seeing and hearing are the same thing. That's the goal. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And I just have a ton of questions uh, Bring it about on. it. So, hey, we'll fire it out. It seems like you on your, your channels and stuff show a lot of how it's done behind the scenes, which I think is really cool. And there's definitely an ASMR quality to your video of like it being very like soothing and relaxing to just hear you doing, you know, high heel footsteps with your hands uh, and yeah. stuff. So I, I think I, that's I, really... I have a lot of uh, ASMR people or, or ASMR, you know, people who appreciate ASMR that follow me. Um, I, I've, you know, personally, I don't really have any ASMR effects uh, from sounds, from audio. For those of you who may not know, I think it's automated sensory meridian response. Is that right? Um, and the concept is creating sounds, really close-up sounds or repetitive sounds that generate some sort of a positive response uh, in, in the body of the listener. Um, so, you know, a lot of people that follow me say that they get that response from what I'm doing, but obviously the clips that I'm showing are just me working on, on films, on TV shows and series and movies. And uh, that's the primary reason for creating the sounds. But hey, if it's giving people positive responses, I'm fine with that. It's great. Well, I think so there's that, that positive benefit of it is you're adding to the experience of movies, even just the sound effects that you're doing is, is adding something that's very playful and fun in a, in a scene. I know you have a ton of fun doing it too, which is interesting. I, I'm sure some are not so fun and can be cumbersome for you to do, or, or you mentioned today you were doing something that was dusty and, and is not entirely uh, fun to breathe or, or do, but there is a very playful quality of about this that you're you're kind of creating something from scratch and you're you're putting high heels on your hands or you're breaking glass uh, you know with a, a hammer uh, or something that's that seems very fun and playful just as an outsider. Do you do you still enjoy it as a a play or is it all work now? Yeah, no, I I totally love what I do. I mean, I've I've been doing this for twenty years now, um, so. You know, I love it as much as when I started. The only thing that's changed now is that I don't have the, the stress the way I used to when I was first learning and training because, you know, studio time is expensive. And when you don't have the experience to, like, figure out the sounds as quickly as you, you know, feel like you should be doing it, um, it's kind of stressful. You start to, like, panic, you know, what am I going to do? I need to create this sound. I don't have the right prop, all that kind of stuff. And now that I've been doing it for uh, 20 years, I, I kind of, there aren't really too many scenarios that come up where I don't immediately have some sort of direction. You know, there's always new stuff, but usually you can relate it to something that's happened in a different scene in the past and then kind of modify it a certain, to a certain degree. So um, yeah, absolutely. I love, I love what I do. I mean, I get to run around in puddles in high heel shoes and I get to, <laughs> you know, like snap celery to make people's arms being broken and, you know, punch myself and throw my body on the floor and, you know, just do, do all sorts of little detailed things and then smash a car with a sledgehammer. It's always different <laughs> and it, it's just, I love it. I love what I do. 
So that's where I was going to go next is I think <laughs> the, the most interesting part for me is some of them are straightforward. I, I saw one of yours, it was like dropping an iPhone and you're literally just dropping an iPhone, but you're trying to get it to spin and bounce the same number of times as, as on the screen. And you take a few shots at, it. I thought that part was really interesting, but that's pretty straightforward. The sound of an iPhone falling is you actually dropping a, an iPhone, Literally. but there's other that are like the celery for bones or other things. What's the strangest or, or most unusual that you would think people would not know when they hear a sound in a TV show that it's actually something completely different. Right. I mean, yeah, most of the time when you're, when you're doing Foley, you tend to be as literal as possible, right? You want to use the exact prop they have or something that's made of the same material and shape and similar so you can recreate the sound. Um, but obviously in some scenarios like, like horror films or sometimes comedies, you know, in comedies, you want the sound to be larger than life. It doesn't have to be accurate. It doesn't have to be literal. You can't stab too. somebody with a butcher knife? Well, I mean, you know, I've gone through a number of assistants <laughs> and... The police are starting to get suspicious. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So you gotta you gotta come up with creative uh, means to to get to your goal, right? So, um, for sure, grocery shopping is super important for um, you know horror films. Uh, I love I love barbecue chickens. They're really like Ooh. viscous and like strandy and gushy. Um, the produce department is amazing. Celery is really <laughs> crunchy. There's like squash and, uh, you know, pumpkin and stuff that are really slimy. I've had to do like, you know, severed bodies crawling down a hallway and like pumpkin, the inside of a pumpkin just creates this really slimy kind of element that works so well. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it's, it's always different, you know, like I had to do for a film called Your Highness. This was a number of years ago. There was... Um, a scene with some fairies fluttering around and we had to come up with a way to make the fairy wings fluttering. And I kind of struggled with that one for a while. Um, I was trying really fast things and I just couldn't get something that would work. So I went to the grocery store again and uh, I was walking up and down the aisles and I found these dried seaweed sheets that you use for uh, like sushi rolls. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's a good texture. And then so I bought a couple of those and then ended up deciding to flip a bicycle upside down and spin the wheel like kids do with playing cards in the spokes. Yeah. And then just kind of inserted the seaweed leaf in there or seaweed sheet rather. And it just came up with a perfect fluttering sound. And that's what you hear when you see the film is seaweed in a bicycle. Wow, that's awesome. I, I like that seaweed in a bicycle is fairy wings now now that we know um now my wife has misophonia have you ever heard of this uh is this the like aversion to certain sounds like repetitive things or chewing or that kind of stuff yes yeah, yeah. the hatred of, of sounds and so it's the opposite of the asmr she could yeah. not stand any of those videos she will like punch people or or like destroy equipment that is like uh, if the if I don't replace the smoke alarm quickly, like it might get permanently damaged. Uh, no, yeah, but I I'm, I'm giving her to it. She's not actually that violent, but she does have a severe hatred, and it will like freak her out. Her heart rate on her Fitbit will jump to like 150, and wow. if somebody's like typing on a, a laptop behind her in a uh, airplane or something, that would freak her out. So we have lots of good noise canceling headphones and stuff. But do you have a least favorite sound? Um. You know what? I think that, uh, first of all, personally, I don't have any least favorite sounds. I'm okay with everything. I do like nails on blackboards and pulling rakes across, you know, sheets of metal and chewing. None of that bothers me. Um, but I will say that every engineer that I've worked with without fail uh, really struggles with chewing sounds. Um, yeah. You know, because we do dinner scenes and, you know, people are cutting steaks, so we'll do all the cutting. And then sometimes in the comedies, they want that, like, you know, really yeah. big, disgusting chewing sound. And they're <laughs> always, like, in record, and I can see them doing this, like, away from the faders and away from the speakers. <laughs> and then as soon as the take is done... It doesn't done, help when you have like, headphones on, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I'm fine. I'm fine with anything. 
Wow. Well, that's yeah, uh, that's definitely good for your job, but I, I can see how that, and I, I see the whole thing very holistically. I, I think I'm an auditory person where I've always just found it interesting. I was kind of a, a mimic too. I like to do impressions of, of people and even from a very young age would kind of uh, do that. So I, I've always appreciated sound, but it, it's interesting to me the, the wide range of spectrum that it can create as far as emotions go from really, really happy positive sounds like music that make people move and dance to like you said nails on a chalkboard they'll make people freak out and run away you have a, a lot of power in your hands there as a foley artist sound is sound is a powerful thing for sure i mean you know as as a foley artist you're you're dictated by what the action is on the screen right it's not you never you're never coming up with oh what could we add into this scene you know you're always doing what the scene tells you to do but within those parameters, there are often ways to, you know, make it even slightly more visceral or make it just kind of pop a little bit more. So that's where, you know, the experience of working for a number of years as a Foley artist and having engineers who are also very experienced, because it's always a collaboration back and forth. We work together to come up with what we think will be perfect for the scene. And uh, okay. hopefully we succeed. Well... That was going to be my last question for you about the technical details. Then I want to know more about you and your career and, and how it actually, uh, you got here into doing this. But sure. my last technical question for you was, I noticed when you're doing your videos that you're watching usually like the video of what you're trying to match. So I'm imagining, especially for animation, but also for movies, people don't realize that you don't just record one footstep and then they paste that in several times. If If they're taking seven steps, you have to take them in time with the the beat of the person walking and stuff and i find that very interesting and almost very artistic i see you get your your whole body into it and you're watching and you're you're trying it three or four times to make sure that it it matches up right i think how, how do you balance a technical thing where maybe i could just take one heel and go into the studio and replicate that a whole bunch of times versus when i need to actually match the whole whole movie yeah yeah, I mean, uh, like we, it, it's way, first of all, it's way more efficient uh, and it works way better to create the sounds as you're watching the scene. Um, you know, everything I do is not always perfectly in sync because we, we adjust things, you know, like one or two frames and there are like 30 frames a second. So um, we always end up editing and lining it up after to make sure it is perfectly in time with the picture and with the guide track that they recorded on set. But you, when you perform it in time with the actor, first of all, uh, you're ensuring that the sounds you're creating work and they feel natural. And um, also it helps you kind of, um, you know, understand the emotion behind the character. Like if it's somebody that's you know, confidently striding down the hall, if we're talking about footsteps, those footstep sounds are very different from somebody who's nervous and might be kind of like shuffling, you know, they don't have as much of a heel toe, they just have a little more flat footed kind of presence. So when you watch that, and you move in time with them, it just helps the sounds that you're creating be more authentic in the scene. Um, and that's true of everything, you know, whether it's writing, or, um, you know, like, punches, you know, whatever's happening, you have to, you have to do it while you're watching to sort of feel it and make it work. How many times have you hit yourself, Stefan? Oh gosh, I don't even, I couldn't answer that. I was like <laughs> over, over 2000, I'm sure. Uh, but these days, these days I'm focusing more on footsteps, which is great. I love that. It's my favorite part of Foley. And uh, so my body is thanking me a little bit. I have less bruises. I actually cracked a rib once by like punching myself uh, <laughs> a little bit too hard. I was out of commission for a bit. It's funny now, but yeah, definitely a, a hazard of the job. You want to find some other materials to, to punch for sure. If you're doing this full time for a, for a long time. Bodies uh, have that's specific all... sound though. You know, it's like it really, <laughs> there's nothing like getting that kind of chest cavity impact. It really works. <laughs> That's great. So if you want to check out uh, more of his work, go to Audio Studio. It's O-D-D-I-O, uh, which is a great name for sure for an audio studio. Uh, but lots of odd fun sounds there. And I know you're also on social media and stuff as well if they find that 
uh, good Instagram follow and and stuff. Uh, yeah, with, same name, Audio Studio on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. So yeah, have a look. Thanks. Then I want to get to know you a little bit more because, like you said, you you've gotten to work with a lot of movies and television shows. Now you got the career pr- pretty settled, and you got your own studio there, but. Did you ever have a real job? Is this something you always wanted to do and went to school for and straight into it? Or how did you end up in this career? Because it seems very niche uh, to me. But I don't know how many how many Foley artists there are in Canada or the United States. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a, a pretty niche job. I mean, we, in Canada, um, I mean, let's just say Toronto. Uh, we're, we're, I don't know, 6 million people or something like that. And I think I know all the Foley artists, uh, which is about probably 13 or 14. Um, so it's actually very difficult to get into. You need to get lucky, essentially. Um, if you have a background in, uh, you know, some sort of schooling in film or post-production or audio, that's definitely beneficial, but really the only way to get into it is through an apprenticeship with an established Foley artist. Um, so I originally came here, I'm in Toronto, by the way, and I came here from mm-hmm. Montreal. And uh, it was my goal to try and get into Foley when I first moved here. And I, I tried to go around to any of the studios that had Foley components to them and see if I could do an apprenticeship. And they basically all said, you know, get out of here. Uh, which was kind of disheartening because I was like on a mission, but there was really no opportunity. Um, So I did move into other jobs for a while. I was in a tourism hospitality industry, kind of like booking hotel space for people visiting Canada and booking hotels across the country, that sort of thing. Mm. And then ultimately I ended up um, some years later sitting beside a Foley artist at a dinner party and uh, we just kind of started talking and hit it off a bit and he said oh you should you know come check out the studio you know and so I just quit my job the next day and just started going up there every day and basically never left Uh, and eventually that led to you know being able to you know it started with just watching and being quiet and listening and observing And then I got the opportunity to try a few sounds, some background people footsteps and maybe, you know, like a knapsack down on the ground. And then that Mm. progressed from there. I got to meet some more people in the industry and uh, now it's been going well for 20 years. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, really, when I talk to people about playful careers, all those stories are kind of similar. It's like you don't just get picked out of thin air to be the Foley artist on a major movie. You have to start on very crappy or free, you know, weekend shifts of carrying large uh, bags of groceries up for a Foley artist and figuring it out. And you get to do some small things first and, and work your way into it, which is, uh, I think, not yeah. unusual for people that, that have really fun careers. Yeah, I did uh, like two years of sort of unpaid observing and training at at the studio where I learned, um, which may seem like a long time, but to me, it was like a a two-year program in a school for free. Um, And while I was doing that, I was, you know, cleaning up the studio after the shift, making coffee for everyone, trying to just make myself not be annoying. And, you know, it kind of doing, then I started doing some night shifts, which were you know, sort of starting at seven and going till three in the morning. And uh, yeah, it's never, it's never easy at first, but it, you know, the payoff is worth it. Yeah. And really when you think about the long term of, of your career, two years paying your dues is not a long, long time. Um, totally and even if it, it takes you uh, five or, or 10 years to get to where you're paying your bills and feeling, feeling comfortable, Um, you're doing work that you love and then you get a career in the job that you love for the rest of your life. So, you know, five, 10 years out of a a 40 year career or something really isn't that bad uh, to pay your dues either. I I find that really interesting. Now, it it seems like an odd, uh, still like an odd choice to me though. Do you know what um, got you into Foley or why you even found it interesting in the first place? Uh, Yeah, when I was a kid, uh, I don't even know, maybe eight or something like that, I went to Universal Studios, and uh, there was a Foley exhibit there. 
wow. where, yeah, they had one of those, you could go into a theater and they selected a few people from the audience. Luckily, I was one of them who were interested in going up on the stage. So we got to go up on the stage and they projected the, the scene on the, on the big screen. And I got to like slam a door and like drop some, gra- I think it was gravel. I don't even know at this point, drop some stuff on the ground uh, and try to do it in time with the picture. And of course, with some other kids and then they play it back after. And, you know, it was terrible, of course, but it was a lot of fun. And it was funny. And I was like, this is a job. People, people do this like for, for a career. This is amazing. So it just kind of stuck with me. And I always felt like, you know, if I can find a way to get into this and there's an opportunity, I'm going to capitalize on it. I love that so much. I have very similar memories. Uh, There were a couple of guys doing a Blues Brothers show at Universal Studios when I went as a kid. And I was like, that is the thing. Uh, You know, black suit, black skinny tie and a hat. And you're just dancing around, having fun and messing with people. And too cool uh, for school. Yeah. And being cool, wearing sunglasses, you know, at night. Um, That's I was like that to me, like if I could again, if I could get a job uh, doing that, I don't know how you would not play for a living. But I've had lots of experiences like that from radio to um, any type of host. I I love hosting. So I do virtual game show hosting and other things where it's like, well, yeah, if you could get paid to host the Price is Right or Family Feud or something like who would turn that down? Why would you not want that job that's uh, that's amazing great gig so totally agree now uh i always ask people outside of work here last question for you what do you do for fun you get to play for a living but but what do you do with the the kids or what do you do to to relax when you want to go out and play and have some fun uh i mean you know these days not that much you know given the uh the environment that we're we're currently all fighting through but um, let's just put COVID aside for a moment. I, I love pool. I'm a, I'm a pool player. I like ping oh, pong. Cool. I mean, you know, my, my first thing is, is my family and my daughter. I love spending time with them, but in terms of recreational activities that I might do with friends, yeah, pool. I like archery. Um, I did some archery Ooh, training like for a one. while. Yeah. I find that really, really very like focusing and relaxing because you're just like so still and you know it's just super satisfying to like let the arrow go and then you know when you've missed that you were completely responsible for whatever wasn't perfect and then you just try it again and try and try and do it completely perfectly it's just very satisfying to me so I I feel like that matches your personality and your profession very well too maybe even all of those there's there's definitely good sounds to pool and ping pong as well, but, but also archery. So <laughs> I feel like you got some great, great hobbies that match up there. Now, uh, do you want to play a game right now? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. I love games. All right. So we don't need a Foley artist for this one, but here is my prize wheel. We're spending, there's 10 games on there and you got Survey Says. Survey Says is very similar to a popular TV game show you might know, but we surveyed 100 people and we're looking for the top answer. If you had the money, name something you'd take lessons to learn how to do. Hmm. Pilot's license. Oh, flying lessons is the number three answer. Congratulations. I'll give you credit. You got the, got the card. All right. Number two. Oh, and I should probably say number one was singing and number two was dancing, uh, by the way. so Those don't uh, seem that expensive. Uh, no, I would think, yeah, if, if money is the, the qualifying, I think yeah, racing or flying is. Yeah, is racing was going to be my next one. But anyways, that's good. Uh, when you hear a strange noise in the house during the night, what exactly do you do about it? This is a great question for you. So the, the question is, what do most people do about it? Yes. Um, and then we'll ask you what you do about it. I would say reach for some kind of a weapon. It is on the card. Uh, four people <laughs> said get a weapon. Investigate is the uh, is the number one answer. I that's, feel like that that, that's kind of obvious, but nothing and go back to sleep is, is number two. Um, so what would you do? And are you better at recognizing sounds around the house i know my wife because of her misophone is always like what's that and i'm like i don't know a car outside (laughs) 
it's e- it's either a bus or a kitten. I don't know. <laughs> uh, right. We I, we recently got a puppy, so I mean, at this point, I would be like, oh no, the puppy's into something. So I would I would just wake up and wander down the stairs and and deal with it, assuming that was the cause. <laughs> Good. And then last question: Name a device that you seriously think you could not live without. Gotta be smartphone. Telephone is actually number two on the list, which really? I think is a bad answer. You could live without a telephone, but uh, TV remote was number one. You can definitely live. Both you and I are old enough to have lived without a TV remote. Absolutely. Uh, awesome. So all these, I think, are bad answers for that question. Computer, <laughs> stove, radio, can opener. I think uh, can opener. my answer would be like a pacemaker uh, or something like that would be a device you can't live without, but that that's Who knows? very literal survey, survey humans and you never know uh what they're gonna say i appreciate you for playing you did win got one on uh every card there i think so uh a free 30 second commercial to you my friend anything that we can do to help you or any asks of the audience uh i i'm i'm good i'm really happy with my career i love being on social media and having a presence there too but you know, the reason for that is because I love sharing my job, sharing what I do and kind of giving a little bit of information about Foley, which people don't really get that much of an opportunity to learn about. So if you are interested, um, yeah, as Mike mentioned, it's Audio Studio, Audio Studio, O-D-D-I-O Studio um, on anywhere, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and I will answer any questions that you send me. If you post something, I'll reply to it. And I'm happy to sort of educate people on the process. Thanks. I love it. Thank you. That's Stefan Fraticelli, professional Foley artist, audio studio on YouTube or Instagram. A great follow there. And if you would like more information on Playful Humans, you can go to playfulhumans.com. It's very easy to remember. And we have a community there where you can join other adults rediscovering the power of play, talking about cool, fun things or interesting, uh, smart, creative pursuits that you can share in the community. It's like a private Facebook group, but you don't have to go through Facebook. You can just join uh, the cool people that are hanging out there. So playfulhumans.com. Don't wait for tomorrow. Live for today. Keep on chasing the sunshine. And go out and play. Go play, everybody. <laughs>